Welcome to the Lipid Maps podcast. I'm Lauren Cocaine. I am the Project Development Manager for Lipid Maps, and in a change of host, I will be hosting our very own Dr. Matthew Conroy to find out more about his role and his background. So, hi, Matt. Hello. How strange it is to be on this side of the desk. Well, we're very much looking forward to hearing from you today. So, Matt, you're the Senior Biocurator for the Lipid Maps databases. That involves responsibility for the data addition and integrity across the various resources that we have. Um, you have extensive experience in molecular data curation and a background in protein structural biology. So firstly, can you explain to us a bit about what structural biology is? Yes, I'm um, I'm the biocurator for lipid maps databases. But as you've said, my background isn't lipid biochemistry at all. I'm a structural biologist and structural biology is to do with the, the three-dimensional structures of molecules. So I think of molecules in three dimensions, where I think a lot of people doing mass spectrometry tend not to. And structural biology is determining the three-dimensional shapes of molecules, particularly macromolecules, so proteins and nucleic acids. And I started off doing that uh, by nuclear magnetic resonance. My PhD was in NMR of proteins. And then after that, I moved on and did some electron microscopy before the amazing advances that have taken place in the last decade in electron microscopy, and then moved on to X-ray crystallography. And all the time doing research was working on membrane proteins. So while lipids were not the thing I was concerned with, I've always been adjacent to lipids. Oh, that sounds very interesting. So I know, um, but many of our listeners might not, that you actually worked previously as a curator for the PDB, uh, the Protein Data Bank, at the European Bioinformatics Institute, EBI. So can you explain to us a bit more about what is involved in data curation and what being a biocurator is like day to day? As I'd done research for some years, it became very obvious to me that I had uh, neither the ability or the ambition to run my own research group, become a research group leader, which is seen as um, the default path for a PhD. So I didn't do that. I took a sideways move and I moved to the Protein Data Bank in Europe at EPI, curating the Protein Data Bank. Unlike in lipid maps, where I have to go looking for the data in the scientific literature to add to the database, uh, in the PDB, no one can publish unless they've deposited their data in that database. It sounds much easier than here. Most of the time is spent dealing with the data that comes in, which is submitted in various forms with various levels of accuracy. We were checking for consistency, making sure everything made sense. But databases like the PDB and sequence databases, Uniprot and GenBank, the European Nuclear uh, Nucleotide Archive, all of which were set up many, many years ago. People like Olga Kennard in the 1970s really had a vision to set up these databases because the whole is much greater than the sum of the parts. When it's all together in one place, you can start seeing links between molecules. You can start seeing trends. So in the sequence databases, you can follow the evolution of a protein through changes in the sequence. In the structural database, you can look and see two proteins that have the same fold, even though they may be very different in sequence. They have the same three-dimensional shape, so maybe they have the same function. So you are just bringing everything, bringing all of this information together? Yes, it brings all the information together in a standard format so it can be queried by other people. And they know where to look for it, of course, if it's all in one place. It's much easier to see all the relationships, to query all the data. Absolutely. Um, so I know uh, that Lipid Maps have recently published a paper in the NAR database issue. Um, could you give me a bit more depth on the paper and, and what you covered um, for those people who possibly haven't read the paper? So we had a paper out in the nucleic acid uh, research database issue in, I think it came out in October, and it describes all the updates that have happened in the lipid maps databases and tools over the past six or seven years. So a lot of it predates me because I've only worked for lipid maps for three years now. It describes what we've done over that time. So we've made quite a lot of changes to our main database, LMSD, the Lipid Maps Structure Database. 
in order to make it more fair, to adhere to the fair principles of data, it's findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Making data more findable. So we've done things like many of the sugars were drawn in projection structure. So a chair projection or a Howarth projection. But unfortunately, when the software interprets those molecules from those diagrams, it gets the computer readable string incorrect, which means it's very difficult to query with computer readable strings. And that's how databases exchange information. So we, we went and redrew something like near 10,000 of the sugar structures, not all individually, some were done computationally in bulk, but we redrew those sugar structures and recomputed the computer readable identifiers. So they're consistent now in our database across many others. I mean, being consistent, is that always a good way to move data forward? Consistency is the, the key thing for me in data curation. If you're consistent and right, that's a bonus. But if you're consistent and wrong, when you find out you're wrong, it's easy to find all the things that are wrong and fix them. Yeah, very true. If you're inconsistent and wrong, that's a nightmare because you can't find anything when you discover they're wrong. And you won't be able to fix it for sure. No. The other thing we've implemented relatively recently is to not change the lipid maps identifier if we reclassify a lipid. Previously, the lipid maps identifier was changed when we reclassified because the identifier contained information about the hierarchy of the classification structure of that lipid. However, that doesn't make the data very findable or accessible. If someone has used that ID in their paper or in their database, and then we've changed it. Going forward, even if we reclassify a, a lipid, its identifier will remain the same as it was when it first made it into the database. So lipid IDs no longer contain that hierarchical naming principle anymore? No, they, they may superficially look like they still do, but actually that shouldn't be assumed. Going further to make the data findable and reusable, what's important to me is to have some sort of provenance for where the information came from. Many chemical databases for a long time they're changing now, they're getting better, but initially many chemical databases had no references to the literature of where these molecules came from. So you looked at a molecule, but you didn't know what its story was, what it did, where it had come from. So we're making sure now that we will record the paper that we curated a lipid from and also the species that it was curated from. If someone is has a, a data set of human lipids from their lipidomics study and they're querying lipid maps. If actually the lipid that they, they think they have a hit from is from a deep sea sponge that's only found in the Marianas Trench in the Pacific Ocean, for instance, then that's possibly a very strange molecule to find in a human. And it should at least ask the question, is this really what I've got? Or certainly the question, what did my patient have for lunch? Yeah, it would be an unusual find, wouldn't it? it yes, it, it needs to start asking the question. Of course, the organism that it's curated from doesn't necessarily mean it only occurs in that organism. Some lipids are ubiquitous across all life. Some are very specific to particular families of organisms or particular organisms themselves. But it's a start to um, record some of the story of what this molecule does. There's a long way to go yet, I think. Um, but it's, it's a beginning of that journey. But this would certainly help our users um, of lipid maps to uh, be more, you know, easy, more easily identify what they are looking at. I hope so. Yes. Great. Thanks, Matt. Um, so you also mentioned the databases um, which haven't pre previously been published in the paper that we've just been discussing. Um, so could you just give an overview of the the newer databases? Yeah, we mentioned um, the Iron Mobility database, which is a compendium of iron mobility data. So iron mobility is another method complementary to mass spec that's diagnostic for particular molecules. And having this compendium on lipid maps so uh, users can look up what a typical um, iron mobility collision cross-section value for a particular lipid is so they can identify what's in their, their studies. So that's the iron mobility database. And the other one, that was developed before I arrived was CompDB, 
So this is around 60,000 lipid molecules that are described only at the bulk level. Very often in lipidomics, you might know, for instance, that you have a phosphocholine that has 36 carbons and four double bonds, but you don't know between the two acyl chains how those 36 carbons and four double bonds are distributed. So this database describes lipids only at that level. It's 36 carbons and four double bonds, but that could be hundreds of possibilities. CompDB allows users to query with a long list of masses, and it will give you different adducts for mass spec. You can query that database and discover what you might have. So there's around 60,000 lipids at the bulk species level. But of course, given that each one may represent hundreds of individual lipids, that's actually a huge area of the lipidomics spectrum that's covered there. Yeah, it sounds like a lot of lipids. But, and that same interface can be used to query LMSD, where lipids are characterized precisely at the chemical level. But users should ask the question, do they have enough information to actually describe their lipid at the chemical level? So do they have data to know where the acyl chains are, where the double bonds are, what the chirality is of hydroxyl groups, for instance? I'm very fond of saying that you cannot describe a molecule simply by weighing it. You have to have more information than that if you want to fully characterize the molecule. But these databases certainly give people a steer in the right direction. Yes, it's a starting point, but people should always be very sceptical of the information they get. You have to be, in science, you have to be critical of everything you do and everything everyone else does. Well, thank you very much for giving us a small insight today into your background and what you do day to day and giving our listeners an overview of some of the new aspects of lipid maps that we're covering in the paper. Um, so thanks, Matt. Thanks, Lauren. And I hope on the next one, I will be on your side of the table once more. <laughs> I'm sure you'll be back hosting. Uh, so thank you for listening to the Lipid Maps podcast. We hope you've enjoyed it and I'll join us for the next one. Goodbye.